Hello, the internet, and welcome to another episode of The Spit Take. My name's Jack O'Brien. I'm the editor-in-chief of Cracked, and unless you time-traveled here from the 90s, you probably realize that reality shows aren't actually realistic, like some sort of David Attenborough nature special about people with personality disorders. But it turns out, even if you know they're full of most popular reality shows are so completely fabricated, staged, and manipulated, they're more like, well, actual David Attenborough nature specials. For instance, you probably know that Survivor isn't totally authentic, since nobody's ever starved to death, but you probably didn't realize they've used body doubles to reenact some of the challenges. Unfortunately, a lot of the lies make reality stars and contestants look like some of the worst people on Earth when they're just regular bad people. But producers have to jizz up the proceedings because they know we don't watch these shows to see which vaguely famous person can revive their career through the magic of ballroom dance, we watch them to see metaphorical car crashes. And ideally, they'd be literal car crashes, but the voice doesn't have the balls to answer my emails. Well, a lot of it boils down to getting teenagers drunk and just setting them loose on each other. There are some cunningly cynical tricks producers on many shows use to tell the story they want instead of, you know, what actually happened. Tricks like this. Look at that! have to tell you that shows like Amish Mafia and Lizard Lick Towing consist almost entirely of stage setups and amateur acting. Oh yeah? You don't put your hands on her. She has nothing hand. to do with her. Even Snopes.com has been annoyed enough by Amish Mafia to just generally declare the entire show false. But because of their emphasis on humility, the Amish won't appear in the media to call bullshit and the Discovery Channel uses their silence to invent bizarre stories about their culture that make them look like idiots. That predatory model of preying on the voiceless is sort of a microcosm of how reality TV works. And sometimes even seemingly straightforward shows like Last Comic Standing and American Idol will use dishonest editing and staged footage to make an unsuspecting participant seem like an idiot long after their involvement with the show is over and they can do anything about it. Take Jessica Whiteley of American Idol, who had gone through a series of auditions before she made it onto your TV. Now, that's worth noting, actually. Before anyone on American Idol ever made it to your TV, they'd been through multiple auditions auditions that weren't even filmed. Every single person you see, even the ones you see in the early Parade of Freaks rounds, have been handpicked by producers to appear on television in front of Simon and Steven and J-Lo. So you'd think the judges would have their shit together enough to be prepared for whatever fully pre-configured cluster was walking through that door and served up to them on a tee. But either because they don't have the balls or a single to give, judges apparently won't on a performer until well after they've left the room. That reaction didn't even happen during your audition. Yes. We have that. We're going to show his reaction right now. So take a listen. Awful. After Whiteley made it through several rounds of vetting by local judges, she found herself in front of the real judges, where she finally choked on her performance. In this song, in this song, in this song. which is sad. Now, admittedly, that is not a great audition. As this clip shows, she's actually an okay singer, so she probably just got nervous or something, but that's a risk you take appearing on American Idol. It's not like they manipulated her vocals to make them sound like shit. They just let her sing four times and only showed the one where she sounded like shit. But here's how national TV audiences saw the judges respond to her performance. Baby, this is not your vibe. This is not your groove right here. I don't know. You got the ball, you got the shot, you go and you shoot, and. It's just not quite going through the net. Can I sing you another song? No. Do people say that you can sing? That you? I mean, what happened? Which must have come as somewhat of a surprise to her when she watched on TV, because that's not what actually happened in the room. No, actually, they weren't. Um, Steven Tyler never said the basketball analogy. He actually called me a sweet girl, which, uh, you know, I appreciated. The celebrity judges were apparently nothing but polite during taping and even allowed her to sing a second song. Um, yes, actually, they did. They didn't really show that on TV. And when they didn't have enough comic relief for the episode, they apparently went back and edited it to look like Randy was coming up with those sick burns off the dome. They could change your voice. They can change your the video, you know, they can do whatever they want with you. As staggeringly cynical as that is, the most shocking implication of that revelation is that Tyler's answer isn't the ramblings of an aging rock star fumbling for eloquence after years of prolonged drug abuse. Someone wrote that No! Last Comic Standing did a similar thing with this bit by up-and-coming professional comedian Ben Kromberg. For his first joke, he gets up on stage, messes with his phone for 10 to 15 seconds until the audience is at their breaking point of what the f is going on in this, and then says, What? 
Like you guys start working right when you get to your jobs? He opened his Comedy Central half hour with that joke, and it killed. Seriously? When he did it on Last Comic Standing, it earned him an applause break, but when the show actually aired, it seemed to bomb. I think you wasted a lot of time up there. What did you say? It's kind of like I didn't feel like you were really respecting the people in front of you. You didn't respect your audience. Did, did, did you guys feel that? Yes. Do you feel okay with Roseanne speaking for you? <laughs> See, they couldn't just show the joke succeed because TV needs conflict. So the show used editing to make it look like the audience cheered Roseanne for saying he wasted the audience's time, and then cheered even louder when Kronberg asked the crowd if that's how they felt. You know, go f yourself. <laughs> What actually happened was Kronberg asked them if they liked the joke and the audience cheered. Is that what you expect me to believe? At least live reality contests like Last Comic Standing have to use the raw material of genuine in-room reactions of an audience filled with real people. Unfortunately, those audiences are coached and paid to say exactly and do exactly what producers want them to. I guess biologically speaking, some of those people are real, but even the non-animatronic audience members are met with applause signs and some poor bastard whose entire job is to jump around and amp them up like his life depends on it. How else do you find an audience member this excited about anything? There's literally nothing that should elicit that reaction. We actually landed on the moon and elected the first black president, and no one had that reaction to either of those huge things, because that's not a reaction that a human being would ever have. Anyways, America's Got Talent's producers and crew members tell the audience when to boo a performance, including paid plants to lead the boos or cheers as instructed. People are also encouraged to follow suit if they see others giving the X gesture, which looks like they're saluting the emperor in some sci-fi dystopia, but actually means they want the judges to cruelly eliminate the performer. They reportedly begged one circus act to appear on the show for seven years, only to lead the crowd in booing them off stage. I know, a show starring Howard Stern brought people in just to publicly humiliate them? It was a disaster of unbelievable proportions. And yet, the only person I can work up any anger towards is this guy. Let's briefly move on from how reality shows trick you, the audience, and pivot to how reality shows work to trick the participants themselves. Nothing's more heartwarming than seeing people in need have all their dreams come true on TV. Unfortunately, a lot of the time, once the cameras went away, so would the dream. For instance, things got a lot less sweet for the people who got free cars from Oprah and free homes from Extreme Makeover Home Edition. When the cameras left and the reality set in that they were on the hook for thousands of dollars in utilities and taxes. This was especially problematic since to qualify for either of those acts of charity, you had to be too poor to afford the things they were giving you in the first place. Maybe the most blatant bait and switch was on The Apprentice, where a bunch of attractive businessy types vied for the chance to hear Donald Trump say, you're hired. Killer Trump. Winners were promised the prize of a top corporate position in Trump's company. This is the chance to work for me at a huge salary. This is going to be the dream job of a lifetime. These are people who presumably had other job prospects they turned down to participate in the show in the first place. Some have their PhD or a Harvard MBA. They own restaurants where they're one of the top real estate professionals in the country. And a few have left their successful small town companies to come to New York City for the very first time. But the ones who actually won say their jobs consisted of being a spokesperson for the Trump brand. So basically appearing on Z103's Morning Asylum to tell James the Pig Ramstein and his sidekick Slim Fast about how Trump bottled water changes the wetness game. That is Apprentice Season 1 winner Bill Rancic, wondering if that's enough water to drown in. When he was feeling more candid, Trump said, it's a little bit too much to ask someone to be the president of an $800 million building when they haven't had that kind of experience. Which makes sense, except that's that's the entire premise of the show. It'd be like American Idol saying, there's a bunch of professional singers out there. Why should we give a record deal to this random amateur for singing well a few weeks in a row? You're a real wise guy, you know that? It's a dumb statement. I was just asking if, you know, that was a dumb statement. Yeah. No, but you are a wise guy. There's no question about it. If you're the kind of trusting soul who thinks turning over one of your most valuable possessions and main form of transportation to a show whose name references the sexual exploitation of women is a good idea, 
you probably deserve what you get. And what you usually got was an expensive paperweight since Pimp My Ride consistently turned out vehicles that were actually unrideable, which is to say nothing of how uncompromisingly de-pimped they were. Amazingly, adding a pool table, arcade game, or even a washing machine doesn't actually improve the performance on a 15-year-old Volvo. Even worse were the additions that at first seemed nice, but the more you think about them, the stupider they become. When we got your car, the back seat was all tore up. So we just got rid of it. We hooked you up with a 15-inch monitor so you can watch what's going on in the back. Sure, you could just replace those seats, allowing you to drive friends around in your car, but now you have a huge stereo and a TV that you have to crane your neck backwards to actually look at. A lot of the new features in pimped cars function just enough to look cool exactly once for the camera. Some were legitimately dangerous, like LED lights that got unbearably hot if left on too long or at all. One guy had to spend 1700 of his own dollars to pay to have his car fixed after it's pimping because the extra weight of the new features damaged the wheels, suspension, and engine. Oh, and remember those shots that made it look like the car was being transformed in a single day? That was a slight exaggeration. People who got on the show were without their cars for six f***ing months. The show didn't even help them pay for a rental car. But it was all worth it because when it was finally done, you had a car that was almost definitely harder to drive, got pulled over by the cops more often, and let's not forget, was god-awful looking. That's assuming you even got to keep the additions. According to participants, a lot of the time, stuff was removed as soon as the camera stopped rolling. One of the producers said that sometimes we did things for safety reasons that kids on the show interpreted as us taking away some items. Hmm, maybe that's because you installed things, told them on camera they were theirs, and then literally took them away. But when every other manipulation just won't hack it, reality shows remove any room for error by also removing any and all reality from their reality show by straight up having amateur actors improvise contrived setups. Up top, we talked about shows like Amish Mafia and Lizard Lick Towing. Urban Tarzan would be another good example, as would Duck Dynasty. Here's what that family looked like before their reality show. But it makes sense that such insanely over-the-top shows would require such extreme measures. But you wouldn't expect shows with much lamer premises to be completely staged. Shows like, say, House Hunters. House Hunters, if you've never flipped past HGTV at any second of any day, follows a person, couple, or family on their search for a new home. That's something that happens every day in every city in every country on the planet. And yet, the show is entirely fake. Not as in the producers pull a few strings to heighten the stakes, as in the producers make the people on the show fake everything and then send them the videotapes. Well, it's not like they don't have rules. They're not lazy. For instance, House Hunters actually rejects contestants who are genuinely in need of a new house. They only build episodes around people who've already bought one. Then it's the participants' job to find the other two houses they're considering. Now, because most of us don't have three houses at our immediate disposal in case we one day end up on a totally fictional show passing itself off as real life, the unchosen houses usually just belong to neighbors or relatives crazy enough to move all their belongings out of their homes so their friends can pretend to consider moving into them. And since these are the houses they don't end up moving into, that involves contestants shitting all over their friends' homes on cable television. So pretty. I just hate the color. It's a gross color. You're a gross color. I hate the bland brick color. I really feel we're going to have trouble matching accessories for the house to this color. The producers finally admitted to all this in 2012, but they swear the show still has value. Gotta take such incredible balls to use the phrase authentic emotion when describing your show, which pays people who have never acted before $500 to pretend they're trying to decide whether to buy two friends' houses or the one they already bought. Let's see what $500 worth of amateur acting buys these days. Overwhelming, you know, like I'm getting a headache. I can't even decide. I'm just so stuck on the log cabin. You know, I kind of knew you would be. I know it's an emotional thing for you. Yes, I'm willing to compromise, and that is the right house. And I'm willing to go slow at the changes that I want to make. You're going to have to. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, thanks for watching that. If you know about other reality show tricks of the trade, please share them in the comments. Uh, like and subscribe if you liked that video. And that's it. Today, her agent Amy is showing them a historic home in the heart of Beaver. The Beaver market right now, there's multiple showings and sometimes even multiple offers.